Well, for those who don't know me, I, I'm not typically a preacher. I'm a, I'm a teacher. And uh, I mention that because um, I'll refer to the fact that uh, to my students just a, a couple of times during my message uh, today. You know, one of the classes that I teach um, in that particular class, we, we deal with what's the difference between human beings and animals. And there's, there's lots of difference between people and animals, but one of the ones is that, uh, one of the foundational ones is that we as human beings, we think about the future, what's going to happen. And we're also aware of the fact that there's death. And uh, that touches us at a, at a deep, deep place. And we wonder what's going to happen after death. And we wonder, what about the loved ones that we've had to say goodbye to and that we're going to have to say goodbye to? What about them? Will we get to see them again? And so we have lots and lots of questions. And, uh, you know, what about our bodies these flesh and blood bodies that we're sitting in here this morning. What happens to them? And over the years, as I've taught, had the privilege of teaching quite a few uh, religion classes, I've been kind of surprised, actually, that um, a a pretty large percentage of the students that I teach actually don't believe in the resurrection of the body. They have the idea that we're going to kind of float around as spirits for the rest of our existence. And Perhaps some of the rest of you have thought the same thing. At any rate, I thought it would be good to take a look at the chapter in the Bible that deals most directly with the resurrection, and that's 1 Corinthians 15. So we're going to look at that passage. Um, It's a long scripture. Um, That's why I'm going to read it in, in, in chunks and in pieces. And I've already decided that the sermon I originally prepared is too long, so I'm, I'm, I'm shortening it on the run here. Um, but I'm also grateful for the fact that I get to preach this particular message this particular day. I was going to share this message a good year ago once, and then uh, Fred kind of stole this passage. And, uh, and so I, I, I put it on the shelf, and, uh, and I, I'm, I actually marvel at the fact that uh, this particular passage is the one I'm preaching on on the morning after Ray Vandersloos' passing. So that's, that's God's timing, for sure. Anyway, we're going to start with 1 Corinthians 15, and I actually asked the uh, AV people not to put the, uh, the passage on the overhead. I want you to actually, if you want to follow along, read, get one of these. Um, it's going to be 1 Corinthians 15, and the page number is easy. One, two, three, four. Page 1, 2, 3, 4, I believe, in the Pew Bibles. And uh, you may want to keep it open, uh, as I will be referring to it uh, repeatedly. 1 Corinthians 15. I'm not going to read the whole thing at once, because it's a very long passage. We'll read uh, sections of that. So 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So uh, these first few verses, you can see the NIV uh, separates this into three different sections. Um, In the first few verses, um, Paul, who is the one who wrote this particular letter to the church in Corinth, just wants to remind uh, his listeners, his readers, that Jesus did in fact rise from the dead. And so we're going to read some of those sort of proofs of the fact that Jesus uh, is alive. So let's read this. Now, brothers, and of course he was including the the sisters as well, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, this good news, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you've believed in vain. For what I received, I pass on to you as of first importance. This is really foundational he's going to share next that Christ died for our sins, or according to the scriptures. And we get that, that Jesus' death on the cross is key. That he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. And maybe this is a little bit uh, more of a different emphasis than we're used to, but Paul here 
indicates that the resurrection is equally important as to Jesus' death on the cross. And that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve, and after that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, although some have fallen asleep, that is, some have died. Then he appeared to James, that's the brother of Jesus, and then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. And we remember the story of the road to Damascus where Jesus appeared to to Paul. For I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it was I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believed. So that's kind of the introduction uh, to the chapter. And, uh, and then the next section, as you can see here, is entitled The Resurrection of the Dead in the NIV. Um, and so in this section, Paul is, is going to argue for the fact that, uh, in fact, we are raised from the dead. And he had to do that because uh, there evidently were a fair number of people in this particular church in Corinth who, although they believed that Jesus rose from the dead, didn't believe that we ordinary human beings rose from the dead. And I suppose they believed that in part because uh, the Greek culture they were a part of, they, they didn't believe in, they, they believed that, you know, your, your spirits would go on somewhere, maybe to the Elysian fields or something like that, but not our bodies. Our bodies stayed dead. And there was also this, this sort of a cult that had come around called Gnosticism. And, and the folks who believed that also thought that bodies were sort of like evil and kind of bad. So they certainly wouldn't want their bodies to be raised from the dead. So evidently, um, you know, a lot, of the, a lot of the folks, even in this church, uh, didn't believe that our bodies, these very bodies, come alive again. And so Paul is going to share that. In fact, it's different. So let's read the next few verses beginning with verse 12. But if it's preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, which of course it is, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? Because if there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. So if dead people stay dead, then Jesus had to have stayed dead. That's his logic here. Verse 14, and if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he did raise Christ from the dead, but he didn't raise him if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ hasn't been raised either. And if Christ hasn't been raised, your faith is futile. You're still in your sins. And then those who have fallen asleep in Christ, that is, those who have died as Christians, are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all people. So there's a few things that he's saying there. He's saying that, uh, you know, if, if there's no resurrection, Jesus isn't alive, which means that the Christian faith is really a waste. He says, you know what, if, if Jesus isn't alive, that means that we church leaders are a bunch of liars because we've told you that Jesus is alive. We've testified to the fact that we've seen him. And if he's not alive, we're liars. But more than that, if Jesus is still dead, we can't be saved. In some ways, the, the, the crucifixion was a little bit like a contest between Satan and, and Jesus. Kind of a gladiator fight, if you like. Because Satan was certainly behind uh, the crucifixion. And it's kind of like they had this conflict there on the cross. And if Jesus stayed dead, that means that Satan won. He finished him off. It also means that our sins were too much for Jesus. They did him in. They overwhelmed him. They squashed him. He couldn't survive it. And I like to use the analogy of of a lifeguard. 
You know, Jesus, in a sense, is a bit like a lifeguard. He's saving us, right? But if you had a lifeguard that uh, saw somebody struggling at the bottom of the pool, and that lifeguard was to dive in and go to the bottom of the pool to try to help that poor person struggling at the bottom, if that person struggling at the, go- at the bottom grabbed on the lifeguard, held him down, and drowned the lifeguard so that that lifeguard also died at the bottom of the pool, if that was the end of the story, there's no help in that. That lifeguard is no savior. And if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, he'd be like a lifeguard which drowns along with the person they're trying to save. So it's really, really important to believe that uh, there's resurrection because the resurrection of Jesus is based on that as well. And he continues on with verse 20. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have been asleep. That is, Jesus is a little bit like, well, my wife picked some strawberries recently. And, you know, when in the springtime, uh, people check their gardens to see if, you know, the, are the first peas on, are the first strawberries there in the patch. And when they see the first one or two, you know that more are coming. And Jesus is like that. Jesus rises from the dead. He's the first one. There's more coming. He's not going to be the only one rising from the dead. The rest of us are going to too sometime. Verse 21. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive, but each in his own turn. Christ the first fruits, and then when he comes, those will belong to him. Jesus rose from the dead first, and when he comes back, the rest of us will rise from the dead. Um, just as in Adam, death came to us all, and Jesus, that one person, life will come to us all. Resurrection will come to us all. Verse 24. Um, then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death, for he has put everything under his feet. And now when it says that everything has been put under him, it's clear that this does not include God himself, who put everything under Christ. When he has done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him, who put everything under him, so that God may be all in all. So once again, Paul explains this, saying that when Jesus comes back, death is going to be done with. And it talks about the powers and authorities being destroyed, about Satan being destroyed. And somehow Satan has, is linked to that power of death. But Satan will be defeated. And it's going to be over. And then in verse 29 uh, to uh, 34, there's the concluding words on this. Now, if there is no resurrection, what will those do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead aren't raised at all, why are people baptized for them? And as for us, why do we endanger ourselves every hour? I die every day. I mean that, brothers, just as surely as I glory over you in Christ Jesus our Lord. And if I fought, if I fought wild beasts in Ephesus, that is probably people who are against him, for merely human reasons, what have I gained? The dead aren't raised. Huh, let's eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. But don't be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Come back to your senses as you ought, and stop sinning. For there are some who are ignorant of God, and I, I say this to your shame. So Paul concludes here by saying, you know what, if, if there is no resurrection, um, like why am I doing what I'm doing? I'm, I'm putting my life on the line. I'm, I'm being persecuted in fact, of course, Paul later on did die as a martyr for the gospel about Jesus. He says, you know, if, we, if there's no resurrection, what's the point of it all? What's the point of sacrificing, of, of doing the good in a way that costs you? He said, if there's no resurrection of the dead, if, we only, if there's only one life, he says, we should just party. If we only go around once, let's just party and have fun and be done with it. But of course, the situation is very different than that. The last section of this chapter is on the resurrection body. And that's something that uh, I'm very curious about. My students in school are always very curious about. And I think you must be too, a little bit. 
You know, okay, so we're going to be raised from the dead. What are we going to be like? What are the loved ones that we're going to be reunited with? What are they going to be like? Are we going to look just like we do now? Evidently, the Jewish people living at the time that Paul wrote this, who believed in the resurrection, thought that they would look exactly like they had looked at the time of death. Is that true? So like if, if I uh, cut off a finger in an industrial accident, I'm going to have no finger for eternity? Um, you know, if I have some, uh, if I, you know, I think there's something about the way I look that's not so great. Maybe I have an overbite or, you know, will that be cured in the next life? Do I have to wear glasses with my new body? How old will we be? Like if I die at 95, will I be 95 for eternity? If you die as a baby, are you like a baby? Are we all like maybe 21? Something like that? Um, those are questions that I have, maybe questions that you have. And I think, I think they're real questions. Um, and so we're going to deal with that here, and Paul deals with that here in this section. This is the clearest section of the scriptures that talk about it. Still not as clear as I wish. I would like more concrete details, but this is as much as is revealed to us. So let's begin here at verse uh, 35. But someone may ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body will they come? I ask that. How foolish. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And when you sow, you do not plant the body that will be, but just a seed, perhaps of wheat or of something else. But God gives it a body as he has determined. And to each kind of seed, he gives its own body. All flesh is not the same. People have one kind of flesh, animals have another, birds another, and fish another. There are also heavenly bodies, and there are earthly bodies. But the splendor of the heavenly bodies is one kind, and the splendor of the earthly bodies is another. The sun has one kind of splendor, the moon another, and the stars another, and star differs from star in splendor. And so it will be with the resurrection of the body, or the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is, is perishable. It's subject to decay. It's raised imperishable, no more decay. It's sown in dishonor, and a corpse is not a pleasant thing, but it's raised in glory. It's sown in weakness, and a dead body is very weak, and it's raised in power. It's sown a natural body, but it's raised a spiritual body. And maybe I'll read the next section as well before I comment on it. If there's a natural body, there's also a spiritual body. So it's written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, a life-giving spirit. The spiritual didn't come first, but the natural. And after that, the spiritual. The first man was of the dust of the earth. The second man from heaven. As was the earthly man, so are those who are of the, heaven, of the earth. And as is the man from heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. And just as we have borne the likeness of the earthly man, so shall we bear the likeness of the man from heaven. Paul, uh, in the, especially in the early part here, describing, when describing what our bodies are going to be like, uses the analogy of, of plants. And it's a very apt analogy. He points out that uh, when we plant something, we, we plant this seed, which is quite small, um, and we put the seed in the ground, and it comes out of the ground, and the plant that results from the seed is very different than the seed. In fact, if we didn't know any better, we would have a hard time believing that this seed could produce the plant that later on we see. And Paul says that in a similar way, we also, in a, you know, most of the time with a dead body, we, we also, in a sense, plant them in the earth, underground. And Paul is saying here that also the resurrected body will be quite different than that body which is laid in the grave, even as the plant is quite different from the seed that is planted. Now, we don't know too much about this, but he does say here in those last few verses that I read that we're going to be 
our resurrected bodies are going to be like Jesus' resurrected body. Jesus, after he rose from the dead, had a glorified body. Now, this glorified body was, in fact, that same body that was laid in the grave. On Easter morning, when they went to the tomb, Jesus' body was not there. And when they encountered the risen Jesus, they encountered him in that same body that they had put in that grave on that sad Friday. It was the same body, but it was different. And as we read about Jesus' resurrection appearances, it's, it's kind of interesting, I think, because sometimes it seems that his disciples didn't know who he was. You might remember Mary Magdalene had a hard time recognizing him, and maybe remember there were a couple of disciples that went with him. They walked like five miles to this one town, and they didn't know who he was until he prayed. So he, he must have looked fairly different. And yet there are other times when Jesus appears when they know who he is right away. There were times he appeared in a room and they knew he was Jesus. Or time when they saw him on the shore when they were fishing, they knew he was Jesus. So sometimes they seemed to recognize him immediately and other times they had some difficulty. Um, and it seems that sometimes his wounds were certainly visible, the holes in his hands, the holes in his feet, the hole in his side, because he even challenged Thomas to put his fingers in the holes in his hand and in his feet. And yet, if I think of the time that he walked those five miles to those couple of guys to Emmaus, I'm wondering if the wounds were visible. I'm thinking not, because you would certainly notice something like that after you walked with somebody for five miles. So maybe, maybe sometimes they were visible, sometimes they weren't visible. And Jesus seemed to be able to do some things in his body that he couldn't do previously. The disciples a number of times were in this room. They had the door locked, the windows were shut, and Jesus seemed to be able, with his body, to kind of move through, that, through the walls and come into that room with them, something he did not do before the resurrection. And yet Jesus was not like, kind of like a ghost because he challenged people to touch him. And maybe sometimes they did. And if they touched them, I am sure they would feel something solid. And he also ate something more than once. Spirits can't eat things. But he ate fish and evidently digested it. So he still did have a body, a glorified body, a different body, but nevertheless a body. So... We aren't told very much here. We're told we're different. It's still our bodies, but we're not giving too many details. What we do know is that our new bodies will no longer be subject to decay. There will no longer be any sickness. There will no longer be any pain. There will no longer be any physical challenges. And even more importantly, our bodies will no longer be sinful. We'll no longer have those, those pulls that sometimes come from our bodies that pull us in the wrong ways. That'll be done. We'll be done with, with sin. And that's, that's good news. But I also want to share something that uh, I think you need to hear as well, that just sort of step apart here a little bit. And I hope I don't offend anybody by saying this, because I'm taking a little bit of a chance here, I guess. But uh, when I moved to Canada uh, about 25 years ago, uh, from the U.S. where I've been living in. And I, as I talked with people about these kinds of things, I, I taught, and I was an elder. That's when I, kind of when I first ran into it. Uh, when I was an elder of a, of a dying man, we talked about death, something you talk about. Um, and I discovered that a fair number of the older people who had had their theological training, I guess, in Holland, had an idea about, their, about the life after death that I had never heard before and that bothered me and still does. And that's why I'm going to share something about it. So what I was, what I was told, and I've been told this by quite a number of people, is that um, in heaven, we're not going to know who anybody is. That although, you know, maybe our husband is there or our wife is there, or our loved one is there, we're not going to know who they are and they're not going to know who we are. In fact, we're going to sort of lose our personalities. And I'd never heard that before. 
And it disturbed me, actually. And so I asked, I've asked more than one person, Where, where'd you get that from? Or why, 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 do you, why do you think that? And they said, well, if we know who everybody is in heaven, then after we're there for a while, we're going to figure out that some people we love aren't there. And then we can't be happy. We can't have the joy that we're supposed to have in, in heaven. So, conclusion, we don't know who anybody is. And uh, to me, that's an argument based purely on, on sort of logic and rationality. And it's not what the scriptures promote. So I'm going to challenge that this morning. Because I want to give all of you hope that you will reconnect with those loved ones you've had to say goodbye to. You know, when Jesus was, was once arguing with the Sadducees about the resurrection, when they challenged him on that one, he used as his key proof that God has stated that he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, individuals who still existed, real distinct people who kept their identity and their personalities. Or I think of the story of King David when his infant son that was born out of the adultery that he had with Bathsheba. And when that child died, David took comfort in the fact that he was going to see that, that little guy again. He knew that he was going to be reunited with that son. Or I think of the time when Jesus was transfigured on the mountaintop and the disciples met Elijah and Moses. And they knew very well that it was Elijah and Moses. They hadn't lost their identity. And so often the scriptures say that uh, the sting of death has been taken away because we're going to be reunited with those we've had to say goodbye to. We're told that we don't have to grieve like those with no hope. For instance, in 1 Thessalonians 4, it says, we don't want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you don't grieve like the rest of people who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and he rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. We're told here and a number of other places that we can look forward to being reunited with those we've had to say goodbye to. Well, I'd like to read the rest of the chapter and in a few closing comments. Beginning at verse 50. I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. He's saying there that we can't enter into God's kingdom unless we have these glorified bodies. We can't enter them with, our, with this kind of body. It won't work. We have to have these glorified bodies. And that presents a problem in which he addresses. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep. That is, not everybody will die before Jesus comes back. But we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. What that's referring to is that, uh, you know, the question that some people would have is like, okay, that's good news about the fact that people who have died will be raised and they'll get these new glorified bodies. But what about those of us who aren't dead, who are alive when Jesus comes back? Do we got to run around in our ordinary bodies for the rest of our life? And Paul says, no, no. When Jesus comes back, there'll be in a, in a twinkle of an eye, and like, just like that, boom, all those people who are still alive will also have their bodies changed to also be glorified bodies. And then verse 54. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and dear sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. So we've got hope. Death has lost its sting. 
We don't have to grieve like those without hope. Death is not the end. And we're told also here that life after death is not some kind of vague existence. These very bodies that we're sitting in right now will be resurrected and they'll be better than ever. All of our imperfections and our sin tendencies will be erased. And we're going to live, the scriptures tell us, in a, in a new earth. We don't know if it's that, this same earth sort of renewed by fire and then made perfect again, or if it's a brand new earth that God's going to make from scratch. But we're going to live in a place that's even better than the Garden of Eden. And we're also, in this new earth, going to be reunited with all those we've had to say goodbye to. The sting of death has been erased. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this good, good news that death is not the end, that uh, the sting of death has been taken away, that uh, we will be reunited with those that we've had to say goodbye to, and that we ourselves too will one day get glorified bodies, and that you have a great future in store for us, that we get to live in this in your new kingdom, which is going to include a, a new heaven and a new earth, and we're going to live a life there that we can now only dimly imagine and Lord, I'm confident that when we're there, if we think back on our life here, and I don't know how often we will, we'll, we'll, we'll wonder, why did we find it so difficult to leave the life we had on earth? Because it's so good where we are now. Lord, that's the future we can look forward to, and that's the hope that we can have. And Lord, I pray that those who are grieving the loss of loved ones right now, that this promise that we have might also encourage them. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Could we stand in a few moments here and sing, Rejoice, the Lord is King. <laughs>